Um, thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Hawkins. Um, we were so excited to be part of this session, and it's lovely to be here with all of you this morning. Give me one second as I share my screen, of course. So our first topic this morning is going to be fostering resiliency in clinical care. Again, I'm Dr. Mona Lisa Taylor, and joining me for this conversation today is Dr. Amber Pendleton. For disclosures, we have none. And our objectives today are to define resilience, post-traumatic growth, and trauma-informed care, understand the current efforts to build resilience in our community, and identify ways to build resilience in our clinical environment and with our patients. So 2020, an unprecedented year. And there were things that we were used to that had to be adapted to fit our situation. In this case, just even seeing our family and friends. I thought this picture best exemplified what last year looked like. We were meeting with loved ones in protected situation so that way they wouldn't get this virus and that causes a lot of stress and a lot of changes for a lot of individuals regardless of how old you are or what you look like so bear with me for a moment as we recap the last year so thinking back on 2020 we had many cases of COVID-19. Now around the world, this is as of this weekend, we have almost 170 million cases of this infection. Across the US, we've had about 33 million cases um, and about half a million here in Kentucky, Indiana with 740,000. And so even this diagnosis of COVID-19 has a stress associated with it. I can't tell you the number of patients that I've seen that didn't want to get tested because they were worried about what that test result would come back as. They were worried about what people would think of them if they did come back positive. And if they did come back positive, it put a stress on the entire household of how do we manage quarantine? How do we keep ourselves safe? And so it's been a hard year thinking about this virus and being concerned that you might end up with this infection or even share it with others, which was another stress factor going into COVID-19 and this past year. Now, as we're thinking about COVID-19, another aspect of this has been the number of people we have lost just from this infection alone. I can tell you at least once a day right now, I'm hearing from a patient who tells me about someone in their circle, either a family member or a friend who has passed away in the last year. Now worldwide, as of this weekend, we have about 3.5 million deaths from COVID-19. In the US, that number is closer to 600,000. Um, and you see our death numbers there in Kentucky and Indiana, right at around uh, 6,700 and 13,000 in Indiana. Now that's all from COVID-19, the infection itself. This doesn't include the many individuals who didn't come to see a doctor, who didn't come into the hospital because they were scared of contracting this infection. And as a result, and we've seen it in our practices, we've had people put off maybe heart attacks, strokes, these cancer diagnoses that are being found later in, in terms of stages. And it makes it harder to help take care of those situations for those families. Now, another aspect of bereavement from this last year is that families haven't been able to gather in the way that they anticipated. Now, if we had a loved one passing away in the hospital, we expect to be there in the hospital at their bedside. And right now, that's looked like one or two people, maybe, um, if you were in a facility. For many others, once that loved one passes away, we're looking at funerals, and funerals haven't looked like what we're used to. It may have been a very limited gathering. It may have been on Zoom. It may not have incorporated that entire circle and group of people that are important to that loved one. And that's caused another layer of grief, another layer of guilt that we're dealing with when it comes to our patients. 
You know, another aspect of COVID-19, um, as you all are not surprised, is the financial hardship of this last year. We've had about 6.1% of adults be unemployed at this time because of the pandemic and maybe the kind of jobs they were doing or maybe because they were homeschooling children or taking care of loved ones who were sick, they haven't been able to get back into the workforce. As a result of this unemployment, we also have food insecurity. We found that 9% of all adults don't have enough food in a week to feed their families. If you have children, that number is higher. It's around 11%. Now, given this financial hardship, we've had trouble paying our rent. So about 15% of all adults have been unable to pay rent. Again, higher numbers if you are someone who has children. It's 19%, so almost one in five individuals who have been unable to pay their rent in this last year due to COVID-19. Now, Transitioning a bit, we've also had to deal with a lot of politics in the last year. Um, that may come as no surprise to all of you on this call. Now, around the world, we're seeing a very nationalistic approach. Uh, right now, Brazil and India, really good examples of that um, with leaders who think themselves bigger than this virus. Um, as a result, we see the Brazilian variant of COVID-19 and the Indian variant of COVID-19 spreading very quickly and greatly impacting the public in those countries. Now, here in the States for us, we've had our own presidential election last year. And unfortunately, we had some different views on what COVID-19 regulations look like, depending on if you were in a red state or if you were in a blue state. And as a result, that is also limited, first off, our response to this virus, but it's also added some worsened animosity and difficulty between family members and friends if you find out that they may be on an opposite side of the political spectrum than you. That's just added one more stressor from this last year. And finally, uh, thinking back on 2020, we've had a racial awakening. Last year at about this time, we watched a man named George Floyd die in front of our eyes at the hands of police. This was recorded. This was nine minutes of video that then got replayed on TV. And this wasn't the only video like that. We've had multiple videos sharing these types of situations. And for Black Americans in particular, their isolation in this past year became a lot more complicated. There was concerns about racism, violence, and then the fear of getting this infection with COVID-19. And this racial awakening has helped a lot of communities and a lot of individuals who did not know it prior help recognize some of the racial inequities that exist in our society and hopefully make some efforts to impact that and improve it. Now, um, another aspect of this um, is locally, we had the loss of Breonna Taylor. Um, and as a result, we've had um, a lot of protests here in our own community and a lot of racial reckoning here as well. Um, this picture here is actually from the Promise, Witness, and Remembrance uh, exhibit at the Speed Art Museum, which is still on display. If you all have not been able to see this um, exhibit yet, I would recommend it as a way to better understand what has happened in the last year, particularly in our community. Now, where do we go from here? What is our next step? And I know recapping this last year was not easy, especially seeing it that way. So how do we move on? How do we help our patients move on? So resilience. Now resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, or even significant sources of stress. Now that's from the American Psychological Association in 2014. Resilience is a product of many interacting factors. It's from biological, psychological, social, and cultural factors. To 
put it in layman's terms, it's our ability to bounce back. Now, another aspect of this that I think we may even be seeing with our patients and our loved ones and even in ourselves may be some post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth is where someone may have some difficulty bouncing back from a traumatic event that challenges our core beliefs. And as a result, that individual endures some sort of psychological struggle and then ultimately finds a sense of growth. Now, this is a process that takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of struggle to get to that point. So looking at post-traumatic growth, um, we may be, as clinicians, that expert companion for our patients. We may be that person that helps germinate the seeds for them to create this kind of growth. Um, this here is an example of Kintsugi. Um, this is a Japanese art of pottery, where if something breaks or cracks, they fill in the gaps with a gold paint, and it ends up making the piece of pottery even more beautiful. Now, post-traumatic growth may show itself in a couple of different ways in our patients. Our patients may have a new appreciation of life. They may be able to relate to others better. They may find their own personal strengths, recognize new possibilities and spiritual change. Now, I'll let Dr. Pendleton talk to you a little bit more about how we foster that resiliency and this post-traumatic growth, but I can tell you I've already seen some of this within my own patients and I'm sure you will too. So how do we do this? How do we make this difference? And one of the things that we've been looking at is trauma-informed care. How do we take what's happened in this last year and help translate that for our patients, for our staff, for each other? And trauma-informed care, one, helps us realize the impact of trauma, the potential paths to mitigate the impact of that trauma. It helps us recognize signs and symptoms of trauma in our patients, family, and staff members and helps us integrate that knowledge into our practices. And finally, trauma-informed care, most importantly, wants to also make sure that we resist that opportunity to re-traumatize our patients and create a safe environment for them, for, again, for our staff members and for each other. But how do we do this? Where do we start? And so with trauma-informed care, all the factors that contribute to creating this type of environment are like layers of an onion. We start with self, then the clinical setting, then the organization and the community around us. Now this morning, we are going to work our way through the onion from our outermost layer to the very inner layer. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the community and organization um, opportunities that we have. Now, to begin, in our community, one thing that we've learned over the last year is that Louisville is very responsive. And Louisville comes together when something is going on. Um, one of the best examples of this is currently the Stay Strong Louisville campaign. And you may have seen some of these signs, some of these masks, some of these um, motivational pieces that have been there to help our community be resilient. Um, now this is part of the Stay Strong Louisville campaign. They also have a lot of information about COVID-19, vaccines, testing, and prevention that has been uh, involved on this website and in this messaging. The other aspect in our community that has been really helpful in this last year, particularly as patients and individuals are dealing with financial hardship, food insecurity, mental health resources, is the Metro United Way. And the Metro United Way has a lot of um, resources and information available. And a very easy way to get in touch with those resources is by dialing 211. So this has been another component in our community that's helped 
foster resiliency, but also help connect people to resources, because sometimes that's the hardest part about all of this. Now, another interesting aspect in the last year has been Louisville's trauma resilient community. I found this very interesting as I was um, doing some research for this for this presentation that in 2019 from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, the city of Louisville got a grant to create a trauma resilient community board. And this was an opportunity at the time to help some particular neighborhoods, the West End and the South End here in the Louisville community connect to more resources to help build resiliency and help handle trauma. And Dr. Pendleton actually serves on this board. Um, over the course of 2020, they actually had to modify and adapt this in a lot of other ways. Uh, but one of the things that definitely stood out is the fact that this is very community focused. They've got individuals, youth that are on this board to help make our community better, help make these groups better, and help make sure that these resources are where they need to be, but also that we're doing all the good things as a community to make a difference in this space. Now, like I said, we've got a lot of resources in our community. And one of the really great resources that we have from our partners um, at mentalhealthloo.com. Now, this is a collection of psychologists and counselors that are in our community that have created a lovely website that adds a lot more resources and information for clinicians, but also for the public. I was very impressed with their crisis support page, which has multiple phone numbers for national as well as local resources that are available here in our community. Another really great feature of mentalhealthloo.com has been a particular focus on ensuring we have a list of Black mental health providers also available for our community as a resource. So this has been a very great um, resource to share with patients, particularly those that may be engaging in therapy and counseling for the very first time. And in a lot of cases, and from what we've seen, having someone who knows your background and who looks like you, it gives you a better opportunity to um, stick with that counseling and that therapy over the long run. So now Norton Healthcare. I've been so impressed with all the resources and opportunities that we've had through our organization over this last year. We have our employee assistance program, which is available for anyone who is dealing with a lot of issues and having some difficulty making it through all of it. We also have an employee emotional care line, which got developed back in 2020 to help as we were dealing with all these cases and changes given COVID-19. The other resource that I've recently found are all the employee resource groups. Um, this is an example here on the right of all of the different groups that are available to us as Norton employees. And it's an opportunity to learn from each other. It's an opportunity to learn from others in that space and be more aware of what our colleagues are going through. And finally, as another great resource that we've had with Norton Healthcare is the Unite Us platform from Metro United Way. So if we do have that patient coming to us and needing assistance, again, with food insecurity, rent, mental health issues, or anything else that might be going on, we can utilize this excellent platform through Metro United Way to help connect our patients to more resources. So, now that we've talked about community and organization, I'm going to pass this conversation on to Dr. Pendleton to discuss how we approach trauma-informed care in the clinical setting. Good morning. Thank you all so much for having me today. Um, I am so excited to be here and I am um, really passionate about this topic of resiliency. So, um, 
can everyone see me? We're good. All right. So thank you, Dr. Taylor, for walking us through understanding uh, resiliency and fostering resiliency in our community and healthcare organization, and especially highlighting the really unique challenges that we've all been facing this past year. So next, I'd like to discuss the concept of fostering resiliency in the clinical setting. So for this layer of the onion, we'll be talking about two ideas that go hand in hand. One is the clinical environment itself and to the direct patient care we provide. So you may be wondering why is Dr. Pendleton suddenly uh, interrupting uh, Dr. Taylor's most excellent presentation to chime in? Well, the reason is while I was working in a clinic that primarily serves children and families living in West Louisville, our pediatric practice really fell on hard times and it launched us into creating a clinical resiliency project. Around this time, I heard a doctor named Nadine Burke Harris speak about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And she talked about building resilience in a way that really made it tangible to include in clinical care. And what she said rang so true to me. Uh, I mean, I thought about all of the patients that I had cared for over the years who'd been dealing with intense adversity from grief, abuse, exposure to violence, racism. And I knew it was the right thing to do to incorporate it into patient care, but I also knew it was really critical for us to incorporate it into our clinical environment because at the time it really felt like our clinic was breaking and not bending. And so just like our hopes for our patients, we really wanted to be able to bounce forward after going through a hardship. So a team of us, wrote a grant called the Pediatric Primary Care Resiliency Project, Breaking the Cycle of Toxic Stress, which was funded by the IHOP Passport Program. And our project used evidence-based strategies and was really rooted in research, but in reality, it was the beginning of a journey. The transformation that we saw in our working environment, how we cared for our patients, how we treated each other, it was really incredible. And so I'm excited today to be able to share with you some of what we learned from this experience. Our project had four components. First, we had a clinic-wide education session about trauma-informed care that included everyone, nurses, front desk staff, providers, social workers. And then next we implemented formal trauma or ACE screening, not just for children, but also for their parents and caregivers. We also implemented a formal social care needs screener that was given out at all well child checks. And then next we worked to build a much more effective multidisciplinary team. We started to hold meetings where we just focused on how to be effective resiliency partners. And then last but not least, um, one of the, the funnest parts of the entire project was reaching out to community partners in the neighborhoods where our families lived. And so we met with more than 25 groups in the community over a 12 month course. And sometimes they would come to our clinic, sometimes we would go to, to their spaces. But it was really cool because we were able to build bridges and all of a sudden be able to really connect families to resources. Along the way, we really appreciated the fact that there is an art and a science of resilience. And so when we think about how one can thrive despite adversity, there's a growing body of literature that tells us about the interplay of genetics and a person's environment. And so science tells us that resiliency can really be developed at any age and we never lose the ability to improve our skills. And data tells us that protective factors in fact do make a difference and the brain can heal. But what we also learned to appreciate along the way was this kind of art of resilience, which I always think of as maybe that which one cannot Google, right? You, you see it, you know it's there, it's hard to put your finger on it. But what we learned was that helping someone or even helping ourselves through hard times is a skill or a craft really. And, and we um, can derive a lot of deep satisfaction from it. So to be, to be able to really understand how to foster resiliency, I think it's important to begin with the basics. 
So you need to be able to appreciate the science of traumatic stress. So first, there are three types of stress that we've been uh, learning about. And we know that positive stress can happen if you're studying for a test or creating a lecture for a symposium. Um, but tolerable stress happens when something really bad happens, but you're supported by a loved one and you can get through that hard time. But then toxic stress, that's when horrible things happen and there's really an absence of protective relationships. Um, and our stress response system, it's designed so that it can protect us. We need to be able to escape and survive. The hypothalamus notifies the pituitary gland to release ACTH so that the adrenal gland will pump out cortisol. But when the system stays on due to repeated stress exposure, then these life-saving mechanisms suddenly become dysregulated and damaging. And the HPA axis becomes impaired so the sympathetic nervous system or our fight or flight system gets triggered even by really small threats. So you can clearly see now that, you know, treatment uh, for traumatic stress should really involve helping the system become better regulated. So activities that help activate, for example, the parasympathetic nervous system, also called the rest and digest system. So what happens when the mind and body are flooded with constant stress hormones? Well, the effects are pervasive. Um, and so no matter really what discipline you're in in healthcare, this is really an important concept to you. The effects on the brain are damaging to neural connections, primarily in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. So our prefrontal cortex, as you may remember, is responsible for planning, decision-making, and also controlling your impulses. And the hippocampus will play a major role in learning and memory, and it connects to the amygdala to help regulate our emotions like fear. So you can imagine what a, what a person may look like in the clinic um, or a colleague or yourself if this has happened to you because it's easy um, to, to see where people may have difficulty with regulating emotion, anger, aggression, struggling with learning and memory, um, all of those things would show up in, in a patient or in a colleague or yourself. We, we also know that we've learned through science that toxic stress even changes the way your DNA is read and transcribed. And that really helps us understand why every single organ system can be affected. It causes problems with growth, high blood pressure, muscle pain, decreased immune function. And and so the effects of childhood toxic stress, I mean, they're so profound that we have learned it increases the risk for seven of the 10 most common causes of death in the United States. And the effects of trauma on health are dose dependent. And so at really high doses, there's a 20 year difference in life expectancy. So after I started to understand and appreciate the weight of this public health crisis, and especially in light of what's been happening over the past year, we know that toxic stress is only going through the roof. And so I, I wanna talk about screening for this in clinics and tell you more about my experience because I, I see that this is really the direction that medicine needs to go. We have to appreciate that so much more toxic stress has been happening over the past year that we haven't even begun to see how kind of damaging and, and pervasive that this, this is gonna be for us and for our next generation. So when I started screening for ACEs in our clinic, it's, we've been doing it for about five years. So I wanna tell you that I have found it remarkably helpful um, and in so many ways. And so remember that we screen both children and parents and caregivers. And so for us in particular as a pediatric practice, we're able to really utilize that, um, you know, kind of both sides, um, uh, both, both ways that we get information. So in one way, it can help us with prevention because we can identify that a parent or a caregiver has a high ACE score. And so we know science tells us that that's, that means that their kid is more likely to have a high ACE score. And that makes sense. So we know 
that we have to bolster their resources, keep close follow-up, and we treat those patients differently and hopefully better. We give them more support and we really work toward breaking that cycle. But I also find it helpful for a patient who comes in with complex health conditions, especially without a diagnosis, and we keep looking and looking and looking. And suddenly when I A screened them and I saw that their score was high, this is like many times the first time that we're able to really get at root cause. And so suddenly the conversation becomes about education and how, you know, and be able to kind of connect the dots for patients to see, oh, now we know what types of treatments are going to help because now we have a better understanding of root cause. So sometimes this is what I will include in a conversation about how, you know what, ordering one more test or one more MRI probably isn't going to help. And so let's talk about how do we treat the root cause of traumatic stress. So the good news, I think, is that, you know, there's so much research right now. This is an exciting field. Um, it's really exploding. Um, you know, the, the studies are just kind of consistently showing that, yes, bad things happen. Um, and uh, the good news is that our brains can heal and that there are a lot of ways that we can be resilient um, in our physical and mental health. And so one of my favorite studies is, is looking at uh, functional MRI in children who have been through traumatic stress. And it looks like, turns out that the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala actually function better after a child has mastered a musical instrument in a positive supportive environment, right? Sometimes the best treatment is not medicine. Sometimes it's prescribing community. Um, also, we've learned from science that mindfulness improves executive function and self-regulation. We've also learned that one positive relationship can make toxic stress turn into tolerable stress. So when you incorporate the science and this understanding of stress and resiliency into your clinical environment, that's when, when Dr. Taylor was talking about, it's called trauma-informed care. So trauma-informed care, it was really first defined in the 1970s after Vietnam War veterans returned with post-traumatic stress syndrome symptoms that were so severe and intense and had such pervasive effects on their health. But this concept has evolved over time and it now really includes a broader understanding that trauma can affect all of us. And so we need to stop asking the question, what's wrong with you? And really ask the question, what happened to you? And just think about how different it looks when you use that lens to help an angry patient who arrives at the front desk, how would you treat someone differently who's struggling with losing weight? How would you treat someone differently who's struggling with substance use despite multiple interventions? And so when we started using this new approach in our practice, our care became kinder, gentler, less judgmental. All of a sudden, it really helped us build trust and respect with not only just our patients, but with ourselves. And over the years, I've learned that this concept is, I think, one of the more important critical parts of building a foundation of health equity into clinical care. Because all of a sudden, you can see how understanding trauma, like racism and discrimination and poverty, you can see how that helps us all treat each other in a more equitable and inclusive way. So you may ask, how can you apply this to your own clinical setting? And so I wanted to share with you good news. So Norton is actually working on a more formal trauma-informed care education project. And so before that fully launches, I think it's okay for you to go ahead and start thinking about it, right? So what, what could you do now to start thinking about taking inventory? You know, think about your strengths, the things you're already doing that are working really well, and also identify some gaps in your clinical practice. So today I invite you to set a goal. How would you like to improve uh, your environment and making it more trauma informed? And next, you know, uh, next step would be trying to think about what would the action item look like to be able to reach your goal? So I'm gonna give you an example of how we did this as a group during our project. 
So during one of our just regular old clinic meetings where we're all sitting together, we posed a question. We said, hey guys, how, and remember that we're still going through hard times. Um, and, and when I say hard times, a lot of tears in the hallway, right? Um, it was a tough time, but we really, um, everybody embraced this project. And so we were like, kind of like, you know, gr grudgingly going through the motions, but um, this was one of those moments where I had a, you know, um, kind of a lightning bolt of this is gonna help us. Um, and, and what we did is this, this exact um, question was posed, how can we put the magic back into caring for children? Because we had lost it. And we had this really lively open discussion and people were sharing and engaged and not crying um, and talking to each other very respectfully. And we said, okay, what if we set a group goal? And, and, and we picked one. We said, okay, what do we want to do better? And what we wanted to do better was help kids through painful procedures. We give vaccines all the time. You know, how can we do a better job not traumatizing them and trying to make it a better experience? So during the brainstorming session, a group of nurses recommended we buy bubbles. It seems pretty simple. Wouldn't that be a cool tool to be able to use? And it turns out that, you know, I'm like, so why bubbles? Tell me more. And they're like, well, it's calming to all of us, not just the patient, not just the parent, but us too. It gives us joy. It gives the kids joy. We smile more. We laugh more. And we deep breathe, Dr. Pendleton, which is going to stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system. The other thing that I found that was really remarkable about just simple bubbles was that what we saw is it was a way to model for parents, you know, how to help a child through hard time in a healthy way. Because what we would see commonly is, you know, we're going to give vaccines, but they don't want their kid to be upset. So they would say, because they love them and they're trying to help them, they would say things like, if you don't cry, we'll take you to McDonald's. So what that's telling the child is it's sending a message, stuff down your emotions, don't feel anything. And when you don't feel, guess what? We're going to use some unhealthy food to feel better. So suddenly what we realize is that, you know, when we can use bubbles, it was a way for us to model a healthy way to get through something tough. And then thanks to the pandemic, we had to put our bubbles to the side. And I thought, oh, you know, we really relied on that. But what was really cool is the day that I heard a nurse, um, I overheard a nurse say, um, you know what? Dr. Pete, you know, she was talking to somebody and um, she's like, you know what, we can still sing to the children. And it was just a simple moment in my day, but it gave me so much joy because it, it showed me that we were learning how to bend and not break. So I want to talk about some more specific tools to foster resiliency when you're when you're face to face with your patient and you're working with them one on one. And I think that Patient care is just so complex and we're constantly being asked to do more and more and less and less time. And so I think it's critical to really simplify our options when we're thinking about behavior change. So I like to boil it down into these three main categories, ask, say, and do. Okay, so first let's think about asking our patients about their experience of adversity and stress. So take a look at this picture. In healthcare, if we saw a person arrive in a trauma bay because they were in a car accident, a team of medical providers would run to that patient without hesitation. But ask yourself, do we have the same approach when it comes to other types of trauma, like grief, isolation, racism, sexual abuse, I mean, I think about what would happen if we got better at just running toward it and really giving treatment a sense of urgency. And so if you're not already asking about it and finding out about it, I wanna give you some informal tools or questions that I like to use that I find really helpful. And one is, did anything scary, um, excuse me, did anything scary, upsetting, or stressful happen recently. Um, also, another one I use all the time is a, is a structure that um, I teach a lot to students and residents because it's really hard when you're first getting started um, to be able to ask these questions. And many patients I've cared for struggle with fill in the blank. Is that something that you have struggled with? 
And so you can see pretty quickly, it's really easy to fill in, even, you know, fill in the blank with substance abuse or sexual abuse or domestic violence. And what I, I think is true is if you have a standard format that you can fall back on, that's really helpful because when you're busy, I think you're still more likely to ask questions um, rather than just getting overwhelmed and trying to move on. So some of you may already be using some formal screening tools in your practice. And, you know, you may find that it would be helpful to add more or change them. You may be really happy with what you're using. Um, and so I just wanted to share with you kind of what we use in our clinic and just help you think about what your options may be. So our formal tools that we use for screening for trauma, we use the basic 10 question ACE questionnaire um, for parents and caregivers, but the original is just too long. So we love the one from ACEs Aware that really shortens it down so it makes it easy to use in primary care. For children, we used to use the original 10 questions, but we moved on to the PEARLS. So it's the Pediatric ACEs and Related Life Events Screener, and it includes more questions. It's very pertinent to our, our community. Um, so questions like looking at community violence and discrimination, for example. That is also on the ACEs Aware website, and, all, and both of those are available in a million languages. So, um, so it's a really wonderful website, tons of resources. Now, we can't forget our standard mental health screening tools, and I think these are the ones that we're most likely to already be using. So the PHQ for depression, scared for anxiety. We commonly use the ASQ suicide screener. We find it uh, remarkably important and helpful. And we have a really lengthy social care needs screener um, because we, um, we have, you know, uh, our, in our patient population, about 95% of the children that we care for have Medicaid, and so their needs are very high. But in your practice, that may or may not be true. So you may want to adopt part of that, just whatever works for your, for your uh, patient population. But for example, um, when you're, you're going to screen for something, it's important to look to see what's already validated. So for example, there's a two questionnaire or two questions that are the hunger vital signs. And so those are uh, validated, um, validated two questions that can be really helpful. So it's important to balance asking about hardship with asking about things that foster resiliency. So you can't forget that part, right? Um, and I think this is what we're already pretty good at. You know, in healthcare, we ask about sleep and we already ask about nutrition and exercise all the time. But I think this is a chance for you to look at the seven kind of domains of wellness that have been identified for resiliency and look to see, are there some that you're not asking about? So for example, do you ask about access to nature? What about keeping appointments with their mental health provider? Or are their relationships healthy? And if you're caring for kids, I mean, do they have a stable, uh, loving caregiver? And so what about for your patients who do have a history of trauma? Do you ask about their knowledge and practice of mindfulness? And so when we learn that a patient is facing adversity, I, I like to pose a question that I use a, a lot um, that I think is resilience building. It's think of a time when you went through something tough, how'd you get through it? And so I, I think that, you know, this is an opportunity for them to share with you something personal, but also some, some part of their um, life where they have already had some maybe post-traumatic growth. Um, and, you know, maybe they'll tell you something like, you know, I really relied on my faith community to get through something hard. And so that gives you the opportunity to really help them reflect on that and see that, um, that they were able to do it in the past and, and talk about some steps moving forward that can help them again. Now, depending on your role in healthcare, you may be more interested in more formal resiliency assessment tools. And there's a great website called Pieces Connection, if you haven't seen it before. And it has over 20 pediatric resiliency surveys um, and almost as many for adults. And so it's something that you could check out if you're interested. So let's talk about some tips 
for what to say when you're trying to foster resilience. I think this could be like a two day conference, right? So I'm just going to boil it down to some nuggets that I've learned um, through our practice or through the project that we've been creating. So um, first, I have learned from my mental health colleagues, what is the right thing to say when a person dis discloses trauma to you? So you're not going to ask hard questions if you don't know what to do with the answer. Um, and so I, I love to really walk through just steps. This is what you can say that won't be re-traumatizing uh, to patients. And so first you just say, you know what? Thank you for telling me, right? Two, empathy. It sounds like that was awful. And three, and you don't do it quickly, right? Um, but you know, third, you'd say, you know, who do you have for support? And fourth, just reassure them that you're here to help. And so I love this concept that the unspeakable is unbearable because what that tells me is just the patient disclosing their trauma, talking about their stress, that alone is really their first step toward healing. I've also been reminded by my mental health colleagues to always avoid the silver lining. So our tendency is to wanna to fix problems. That's what we do, right? In healthcare, we, we fix problems. But, you know, and especially when you're busy and overwhelmed, you just kind of need to move on. But I want to point out, you know, really, really try to avoid a silver lining. So the, an example would be, let's say a person shares with you something really awful and hard. So they tell you their partner cheated on them. And so you try to point out what's good in their life at that moment, because you're just trying to fix it, make them feel better. And so maybe you say something like you regret, which is, oh, at least you have a great job. Mm. Yeah. So you don't want to, to point out something good when instead what you really need to do is just kind of sit there in that awful feeling and, and share, um, share that feeling with them and show empathy. So you would say, you know, that's horrible and I am so, so sorry. And I also love um, this idea of using reflective listening so that's a great way to foster resilience. Um, and so where you just repeat what they say, so you'll say, so I, you know, what I'm hearing you say is, and then you reframe their words, but this is a, a really great tool. If a patient is saying something negative about themselves and all you have to do is add the word yet. So for example, let's say that a patient is, you know, really down in the dumps because they still are smoking. Um, and, and so what you could say is, you know, what I'm hearing you say is that you haven't stopped smoking yet, but I'm also hearing that you're ready to make a change. I mean, certainly if that's true. So let's move on to some specific things that you can actually do to foster resiliency. So we all know um, that a person has to have their basic needs met or really nothing else can get better, right? And so I always like to start there. And I, I you know, let's think about how different ways of addressing a basic need in itself can be resilience building. And we're going to take food insecurity as an example. So if a, if a person, um, you know, is positive, their hunger vital signs are positive, and yes, they do run out of food or worry about running out of food, then one option is to get food from your food bank in your clinic if you have one. Or, you know, say there's a food bank up the street, you can get food there. But what if you also did some other things? So, and this is a really big deal to be food insecure. So just handing them food alone, I personally don't think is enough, or it's just kind of a missed opportunity. So also what you could do is you could share with them the Dare to Care website. And what I'll do is, is say, hey, check this out and look, you enter your address or actually I'll have them do it on their phone because if they do it once on their phone, then they're more likely to do it again on their phone. And so I'll say, ooh, pull up this website and you know, I'll show them, they put in their address and they see the map and that stays up to date. Um, it's way better than me just handing them a handout that's gonna be out of date by next week. Um, also, just like Dr. Taylor talked about the 211 website, or sorry, the 211 phone number, or you can text as well, Metro United Way um, is an amazing resource. Uh, they also have built a cool app, Louie Connect, which is very user-friendly and visually engaging. Um, but I also want to show you guys the Find Help website if you haven't been using that one. I find it helpful for certain situations, and I'll show you that next. Dr. Taylor also told you about what's 
great um, that Norton has partnered with Metro United Way that we're gonna be joining the Unite Us platform. And that's where we'll be able to directly refer patients to over 300 partners in the community. And then sometimes you just know they need a person. They really can't just navigate this on their own. Life is on fire, things are too much and they need a social worker. And so you need to connect them directly to a person. Um, and that's certainly another way to build resilience because they'll have that connection. And so if they need something in the future, they could reach out to the social worker again. So I'm gonna give a shout out to one of our amazing social workers, Angela Johnson, who showed me this website and I use it all the time. So it was previously named Aunt Bertha and then they changed the name to findhelp.org. And why it's so great is that it actually has resources that are really comprehensive in every single county in the United States. And it's translated, the whole website is translated into over a hundred languages. So just down at the bottom left corner, you can switch it to any language. And so I really especially use this when I'm caring for a patient who doesn't live in the community that I'm used to serving. So, you know, if I don't know, um, you know, resources in Indiana, for example, then this is a great website. Or if a family um, doesn't speak English as their primary language, then this is something that they could use really comfortably on their own at home if they, if they needed it. So next, um, I want to just talk about how, you know, one of the most common things we do in healthcare is this, which is enhancing protective factors. And you probably don't think about it that way, but all the time, this is what we're doing. We're asking about relationships, sleep, exercise, and then we recommend a behavior change or treatment. But so I want you to, to just give some space here for you to think about how you do it. Do you decide for yourself what your patient needs? Or do you ask the right questions to allow them to choose what's best for them? And I also want you to think about, you know, it, this is kind of a chance to, to go through, you know, in your mental checklist of what types of resources are you recommending? And are there any gaps? So for example, I take care of a patient population that has um, really high experience with discrimination and racism. And so I think it's important that I have a list of mental health providers who specifically treat race-based trauma. And so I think it's just a, sp a space or a chance for you to, to go through kind of these seven domains of wellness and say, hmm, I wonder if there are any resources that I, I need that I don't have um, that I'm sharing already. So finally, we learned that um, building connections may be the single most important part of helping our clinic, you know, not just get on its feet, but to thrive. And our biggest take home message is that we just can't do it alone. Great patient care takes a full village. And so we did a couple things. We created a multidisciplinary team um, that, you know, that we really focused on making sure that our team members, social workers, our nurse care coordinators, our integrated mental health providers, that we're all working together and feeling um, like, like they are a part of being able to give feedback to the system. Um, and, and we always are inclusive and invite them to all the meetings. And so everybody feels equal members, um, equally important part of the team. And then I think, you know, this kind of thinking about prescribing community in a way that we take it as seriously as prescribing medicine is a huge important part of the way I have shifted the way I provide care. Um, and so now, you know, I can refer somebody for after school program and say, I've been to Cabbage Patch House. Um, or I can say, you know, oh, it seems like your gap is that you need more parenting support, like from a group. You just don't have a lot of people in your village. And so I might refer them to uh, Play Cousins Collective, where they'll have, you know, be able to build that village. And so last but not least, at the core of fostering resilience is really ourself. Um, you know, in healthcare, we're always carrying other people's stories, right? And that's one of our greatest privileges in medicine, but at the same time, one of the most challenging. And so all the while, I think, you know, we have our own story, our own hardships and triumphs. And so the question is, how do we find resiliency ourselves? And so good news is that this morning, we're gonna be hearing more about provider wellness next from Drs. Werner and Shermer. They'll be talking about compassion fatigue, and that's especially timely when we are experiencing some of the same unique hardships, just like our patients have this past year. 
thank you so much for joining today. Um, this topic is really near and dear to our, our hearts. And um, I wanted to share just a few resources that, that uh, I have found really helpful. And so we'd um, be very happy to take your comments or questions. Thank you, Dr. Pendleton. Sorry, uh, Dr. Werner, were you going to weigh in there? I know we're short on time. We're a little short on time, but I thought we had one question. Dr. Hopkins, did you want to address that or would you like me to do that? Absolutely. No, I can go ahead and, and uh, share that with the group. So um, the question was asked and, or, and the comment was made that considering stress is a part of life, um, at what level does stress become toxic? And Dr. Taylor, I thought you had a lovely response. Um, if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing that with the group. Sure. Um, toxic stress is a strong, frequent, prolonged adversity, which impairs your ability to bounce back. So it's like one thing happens, another thing happens, and it just kind of compounds on each other. And that causes the prolonged activation of our body's stress response system that Dr. Pendleton was talking about earlier in her presentation. Now, this is going to look different depending on the individual in front of you, because we don't know what kind of childhood traumas they may have suffered, what kind of experiences they've had in adulthood as well. So all of that goes into that toxic stress for individuals. You know, I, I am so grateful for the resources that, that both of you shared today. Um, you know, I first met Amber many years ago at a meeting, at a community meeting about resiliency. And so, you know, I feel like this is, you know, just part of, the, part of our continuum and our relationship. Um, and, that, you know, I've, I've always been so impressed by the work that, you um, that she has done over at the Novak Center. And then more recently, Dr. Taylor, knowing the work that you've done with the Louisville Medicine Society with uh, Norton Community Medical Associates. And then of course, I first became aware of you when I saw you on a panel for uh, JCPS, uh, answering good questions about reopening and how do we support the well-being of our kids as they go back to school. So I know that this is a topic that that you're both so passionate about and I'm so grateful for you lending your expertise in this area. You know, I think one of the things that, you know, one of, one of my sheroes, uh, Ann Mastin, who is a, uh, a researcher, one of our godmothers of, of resilience research, describes resiliency as ordinary magic. And I really love to bring that idea into my work when I'm thinking, working with patients who have experienced toxic stress, who have a high ACE score, reminding myself as a provider and reminding them that there's so many ways through leveraging the strengths that they already have, uh, leveraging cultural strengths, which I, I feel like is a, is a really important aspect of uh, identifying and understanding that already they have embedded within them and around them opportunities for reinforcing resiliency to, to counter the impacts of toxic stress. So thank you so much for highlighting what I think is such an incredibly important topic. I'm excited about the strides that, that Norton is taking to, to really in, reinforce uh, trauma-informed care across our system. And uh, thank you again for your time.